Okay, great. Uh, so, as I said, we are ready to begin session two. Session two, as uh, Athena just said, um, is somewhat overlapping with session one, um, not really by design, but uh, just uh, just so happened. Um, most of the talks in this session will be about um, uh, contact tracing, exposure notification approaches. Some of them are complementary, some are conflicting. Uh, there might be a little bit of this of a lively and spirited discussion at the end. Uh, we'll keep things, of course, civil and no scratching and eye gouging and punching below the belt. Uh, just like no, so no UFC, more like boxing. Um, so um, without further ado, I think uh, the first person to go is Carmela Troncoso. Uh, so uh, Carmela, if you can share your screen. Yep. You need to stop sharing yours. I think you should be able to kick me out, but uh, no, I'm not. I wish, but I cannot. Uh, okay, okay, sorry. Uh, stop share. Okay. Great. Yep. So, what I wanted to talk about today is about the privacy engineering of the apps. Um, if I think about my period working on this, which is the fastest sprint they have ever done in my life, whether in industry or in academia, only the first three months were actually about a protocol. And since May till now, and the work continues, I have been working on the privacy engineering. And with this, I mean that the protocol is a very small part of this privacy app. In fact, at the Deep 3D team, we had more than 30 researchers because we needed a lot of different expertise to actually get this done, right? And to get correctly the requirements from privacy, to get correctly the wireless part and a lot of things. So just because Jim only, only gave me seven minutes, I will just speak about how to kind of put these three things with respect to privacy, the health system, the app and the mobile uh, operative system. So you know the protocol by now because dp 3 d is like GAN and uh, that's what we use uh, in Swiss COVID. And as Jill explained, whenever we want to um, upload codes, what we do is we collect a code from the health services, you put it on the app and then you can upload your temporary exposure to it. And this is the slide that they show in non-technical talks. And what I don't really say uh, when I'm just talking at a high level is that this matters a lot for privacy. And this is because if this is the only time that we upload something to the server, the action of uploading reveals that you are COVID positive because only COVID positives uh, add something. So that means that we needed to do something about it. And of course, if you come from my field, the first thing you think about is dummy traffic. And it's dummy traffic because Real uploads must happen. We cannot eliminate it. So the only thing that we can do is posit the vulnerability by adding more and more things. Um, and that means that we need to have some constant side. That's kind of the easy part. But then a lot of other things that I have written in my papers before now have become very difficult because I need to make sure that I don't kill the battery by sending a lot of traffic. I have to make sure that I don't kill a lot of bandwidth and also that I don't hit the server a lot because you know, uh, the Swiss government pays money for every time that I go there and I download traffic. And on top of everything, it is a lie that in reality, users are um, sending through a Poisson or, or one of these things that they would write on a paper. We have no idea what is the real behavior about when users do this. So with the sign of system, I'm not going to really talk about that. I want to talk more about the problems that we had when implementing it and not really about the scheduling. I'm happy to talk about that offline. Uh, but in reality, this thing is a lie. This is what I tell in presentation. In reality, it works more like this. Actually, when we get a code, the code, uh, the, the physician gets the code from another server that we never tell people it exists when I'm just explaining the uh, system very lightly. And then the app, when you introduce the code, goes to that uh, code server and gets uh, a different kind of information that this is the one that you use to authenticate. That means that my dummy traffic does not only need to mimic real uses and all of these things, although also needs to include this authentication step. So it becomes more complicated. Um, but in reality, it so happened that indeed, this was not the only thing. Uh, actually, because we don't work on our own protocol, we work on whatever Google and Apple put on their phones. It turns out that prior to version 1.5, they decided that 
uh, as a security feature, the keys are only returned after they expire. So that means that the key of the same day is not going to be uh, ready for me to upload it. And now, as designers, we are between the rock and a hard place. Either we delay every key one day, and then we defeat the purpose of the application, which is to be fast, or we have a second upload. And that's what we did. So actually, whenever you upload something, you receive another token that you receive again. But now, this to be, needs to be again mimicked by the dummy. So we needed to redesign again our system to take into account whatever the libraries we build on decided to do without um, our own uh, input in there. More things that happen is that in paper, dummies, you just say, you send the dummy and the dummy goes. In reality, sometimes the phone does not wake up. Sometimes they have little processing time and they don't get the time to send the dummy. And anecdotally, because uh, of these processes that uh, don't go up all the time, our app also goes to a configuration server to get parameters all the time in case there needs to be a change, uh, especially for the distance measuring. And our developers thought that we need to make sure that every time somebody opens the app, we need to go and um, fetch it because we don't know when we're gonna wake up again. But that was something that was not considered in our flow. So we needed to actually redesign now their way of collecting configurations for so that our privacy engineering as a whole would work. But the reality is not only that, it is even worse. It is a lie that these servers here are like this. They are actually on the cloud of the Swiss government. And this is actually the black one and this is the red one in the previous slide. And they are behind a sort of uh, firewalls and load balancers that of course we need to prevent uh, DOS and other things. But now all of those things in the fact that they are configured to lock stuff, which of course were not considered in our uh, privacy design. So we have to go and work with them to make sure that the different logs that are collected here in the yellow part, in the red part, and in the black part, when you put them all of them together, they don't reveal which IP corresponds to which key, and they actually don't defeat the purpose of all of the dummy traffic that we put in there. And this was another bunch of work that they never imagined that they would have to do when we just designed the protocol. Um, and just to finish uh, where we are, uh, right now, we are um, at 1.6 million active users. That means users that do have the app working. And to collect that, we designed another privacy mechanism to make sure that our data collection for active users does not defeat all of the other things that they said before. Uh, we have more than 1,700 um, uh, users that have uploaded the keys. That's 16% of the positive cases in Switzerland. And that is kind of nice because it um, reflects the, more or less the percentage of active users, which means that we observe that uh, all the kind of all the people that are positive that have the, the, the app do upload their keys to the server. And also we have very positive um, feedback. We already have 65 positive cases uh, that on the testing, they report that the app is the reason for going to take a test. And we also have the first indication of the speed, which is one of the main reasons why we're putting this in place so that we can notify people faster than uh, the manual contact tracer. And by now, I think uh, I cannot get the number. I will find it while the other people talk and I can report later if people are interested. What is the gain? Uh, it's, it's kind of a, uh, a half a day or something like that. So the key lessons for me uh, from building this app it was that uh, integration with the health system is the key. And it is very hard, first of all, because you have to understand how they work. But then because it comes with all of these other problems that in the protocol or when we write a paper, we don't have. And privacy engineer in a, an agile service world, like this agile thing that is changing all the time when they have services like this guy in library, is exhausting. The amount of work that we have been doing and the amount of times we have redesigned every mechanism is amazing. And now we need more things, right? We're now working on how do we collect uh, indicators for effectiveness and also on the interoperability, uh, the thing that Pablo was saying, that we are now going to integrate with other countries in Europe. But it turns out that those things are going to put more flows of data, which means that now we need to do more privacy engineering to make sure that all of these new steps that we are integrating in the app actually um, don't mess up our privacy mechanisms. And with this, I hope, Jin, uh, I have been on time and I'll be very glad to take questions in the Q&A and also after in the panels. Okay, uh, thank you, Carmel. Um, Lal, uh, Lalita Sankar from ASU will take over. Lalita, you have uh, 10 minutes, you need to unmute and share the screen. OK, 
Okay, no, mute it and now go ahead and share the screen, please. Perfect. Floor is yours. Ten minutes, please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to largely, I'm not going to talk very much about privacy and contact tracing as much as a, a contact tracing app that builds on DP3T. So it's a nice segue from the previous talk. And this is joint work with some of my amazing collaborators and colleagues here at ASU. Uh, they're all working on different parts of this project. And a big shout out to the NSF for funding us and for Google for believing in this work. Um, so what is this work about? What we want to build is to build upon DP3T to use Bluetooth and GPS. So a way to take care of some of the security problems of just the Bluetooth alone protocol. Um, and what we also want to do is actually use all this data that's being collected on these devices, especially in a university setting such as ASU, um, we're doing daily health surveys. Every one of us, including me, has to do it. And if you don't do it, your uh, login to the entire ASU environment is gone. Um, so with all that data being collected, uh, surveys that are being uploaded and continually monitored, is there a way for us to do a risk assessment of different individuals from the student cohort to the staff cohort, right? Um, ASU is bought into this. And so our ultimate goal is to see if we can actually deploy this both at the survey level to do risk assessment and the contact tracing level into ASU's uh, mobile app. ASU is not doing any digital contact tracing at the moment. All right, so this is just a visual of what we're going to do, and I'm just going to dive into what we're going to do in the interest of time. So I don't need to preach to the choir here about what contact tracing is, but in our context, uh, when two parties meet, they will still communicate peer-to-peer -peer with the BLE tokens, but locally what is stored is a hash of the BLE token and the timestamp and a geo hash of basically the GPS location. So if you're infected, you share this with the server and one way of getting around the other security problems of uh, classical um, BLE based methods is now you have when, where, and you can avoid some of these attacks, right? Um, so in short, what we've done is really um, built this out. And um, at the moment we have about a couple of phones that work really well and our devices where we've uh, taken DP3T and built over it to build our own hash protocol, which is GPS plus Bluetooth token plus um, timestamp. Um, so far we are successful. One thing that we want to incorporate into this, which will be very useful for ASU, is to actually get a sense of infected hotspots real time. So that means in addition to everything else that's being sent, we actually want to build out a vector, a binary vector that's, you know, will be shared encrypted, which basically tells you all the locations that you as a user have visited. So then we can do uh, private matching and addition secure aggregation in the cloud to get a sense of a histogram of locations. And if you're infected, you can actually get the infected hotspots. Um, this is not, we're still working on this. And uh, our hope is, especially in the dorms, this can be really useful. Uh, in addition to all the physical contact tracing we're doing, right? This can become a hard problem if the vector is very large, especially in a state, but at ASU, our focus is really on buildings and locations on campus, right? So in, in terms of prediction on the phone, we're hoping to do three things. We want to build a baseline model that sort of it's a one-time survey that you do. It, it incorporates all your existing possible comorbidities to come up with some kind of a risk uh, ASU collects, anytime you use the mobile app, basically we have access to your uh, mobility patterns on campus. So we can look at mobility-based risk index, which would be dovetailing into all these infected hotspots business to get even a sense of where traffic is moving uh, during the day with students and so on. Um, the last thing we want to do is to use a biomarker on device. Um, my colleague Visar, who is a part of this grant, is uh, is in the College of Health Solutions and has enough research to show that phonation-based biomarkers indicate are, are closely correlated with respiratory infections. So that's one thing we want to use on device to do. And there's a lot of work here in terms of getting IRBs and HIPAA data and so on. So we're in the process of doing all that. Very briefly, I'm gonna talk about each of these three things. Um, we're actually working with a startup called closedloop.ai 
Um, this is a company that works in the healthcare space. They have a lot of Medicare and Medicaid data, and their goal was to see if they could come up with a baseline risk. So how do you do that when you don't have COVID positive infection data is they used hospitalization um, based on having um, upper respiratory infections uh, you know, the rate of hospitalization, you collect a year of data, in the next three months, are you hospitalized? That's the proxy for risk to COVID. So they've built something. What we are helping them with is actually improve their model, which is sort of based on XG, which is very standard for healthcare data, to with a bunch of loss functions that we have developed that are very robust to both noise and class imbalances. And keep in mind, whether it's COVID or a lot of healthcare data sets, there's a huge amount of class imbalance. So that's what we're gonna use as our baseline vulnerability. And we want to be able to use that in addition to, um, uh, you know, if you're on campus moving around, can we do some kind of a federated learning model to predict uh, mobility and to predict perhaps how our infected hotspots are moving and as well as just mobility based hotspots. Right now, ASU is, in, in buildings, it has this Wi-Fi access points, and that gives us some sense of mobility. But if we could actually build it into the phone, because we already have this GPS on the phone, and do this in a federated manner, then we, our goal is to ultimately do this in a federated manner. Right now, what we're doing is we're actually looking at how well can you predict mobility from GPS data. It's actually a poor classification problem. Our hope is in a campus environment, this kind of prediction can really be improved. Um, because it's a limited set of locations, you're quantizing to fewer locations. We also have side information on students, for example, on where they could be moving based on their class schedules. So we're hoping to improve our prediction here. Um, the last thing which we just got data for is how do you incorporate phonation? This means the ASU app has to incorporate some way of actually testing phonation, which we're, we're working on. But we got a good data set with both normative um, phonation, pa you know, phonation patterns for people with normative um, uh, respiratory behavior, as well as for those who don't have it. So we want to learn based on that and then push down a model. Um, our goal here is to just take some new data sets that we have to learn this. Um, putting it all together, the ultimate goal would be to do all this in a federated manner. Right now, we're a little bit far away from that stage. We're building what we would call the preliminary models using data offline um, on, on all, all three of these. Ultimately, we'll push these models down and hopefully over time, as we continually collect data, we will build, we'll move into the federated environment. Um, the assumption here is that this is not gonna go away for at least a year or two. So there is room and time to actually build a solidly good uh, federated model. Um, ASU's uh, University Tech office and all the upper management at ASU is incredibly interested in this, being cognizant of the fact that this is not going to go away. So our, where we are right now is actually testing this app in stages. We are nowhere close to actually integrating the app. We're at the stage of learning these models. In the next several months, we're hoping to test out in a very limited environment and then push forward from there. Um, the challenges we sort of see in these two different aspects is on the contact tracing side, we're quite optimistic that Bluetooth and GPS would work, but um, we've right now scaled it to about, you know, assuming that the server can get about 50,000 hashes in a certain window of time, we can go up to that point, but there are real trade-offs between the kinds of privacy guarantees we can give and the scalability in terms of number of users. And certainly when we start looking at aggregation, how many infected hotspots should we, or how many hotspots should we be monitoring in terms of infections? So all of this will become a big deal. Uh, the Tempe campus at ASU has 60,000 students. How this scales is something that remains to be seen. Um, on the device side, um, mobility prediction is not an easy problem. Um, top five mobility prediction uh, accuracies are far better than top one. Uh, we're hoping that by quantizing our locations to just on campus, we can improve our prediction. Um, on the survey issues, uh, we've just finally gotten our survey done. Um, how we integrate these models, we have to worry about HIPAA data and consent and so on. 
all of this is happening right now. The ultimate holy grail is what kind of models are we going to use for each of these different parts? So I'm going to leave it. I'm done. Maybe I went a little faster, Jean, but. No, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You, uh, you stick stuck uh, exactly to your same slide. Uh, thank you. And uh, now we have uh, Claude Castellucci from INRIA, uh, who gets uh, about the same slots, 10 minutes. Um, Claude, can you please uh, unmute and share a screen? Okay, we see you and your screen is on. Is it okay. right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ten fifty-one. You have ten minutes. Okay. Thanks a lot for the invitation, Jim. Uh, just before I start, I just wanted to say that I'm not uh, talking uh, for the French government or not even for Latino. I'm just talking for myself. And um, sorry, I don't see the. Do you see the slide? Yeah, so basically I made up this story about Asterix and the Codex stressing out like a few months ago uh, because this is really all we felt when we were designing this, uh, this, this app. Uh, we really felt like we were uh, this, the small, I don't know if you all know uh, Asterix, but we really felt like we were this small village that was trying to fight against the um, invaders. Uh, I don't have the time to go through all this story because I only have 10 minutes. Um, so I, I will just be quickly and, and hopefully uh, you understand the point. So basically the idea is to develop these apps and um, there are two architects. One, one which is Asterix, basically the French. These things that we need to centralize it I and mean, to have a centralized scheme. And the other one which is Obelix, things that we need to decentralize. So I will just talk about Asterix because that's the French um, application point of view, and I will give you some motivation why we actually decided to go for this uh, centralized uh, or so-called centralized scheme. So very quickly, how the scheme works, it, it's actually the name of the protocol is actually called Robert. I thought, uh, to interrupt, interrupting you, but your slides are obscured in the upper right hand corner. We, uh, they're not visible. Oh, really? Yes, there is like a, bl a black blob in the upper right hand corner now okay you see yes uh, now it's gone you took presentation uh, please yeah i was in presentation mode actually so, uh, so. it's privacy privacy preserving yes okay uh, let me try again uh, this is fine you can even keep it like this it's okay is it better or is it the same the blob is gone now. Okay, so uh, basically this is how the scheme works. So we also have a proximity discovery scheme that is very similar to the Google, to the GAN approach. So basically the nodes, they are changing ephemeral IDs over the Bluetooth uh, interface. The only difference is that the ephemeral IDs are generated by the uh, servers, the server, sorry. Then we have infected user declaration. So when a node, a user is infected, he basically has to uh, upload the list of the ephemeral IDs of the other nodes that he, he met. So each app has actually a list of the ephemeral ID of the node that he uh, encounters. And if he's infected, he actually uploads this, this list to the server. And the server basically keeps for each register user uh, an entry and, and one uh, uh, entry is actually a score, a risk score that is computed using different variables. And one of them being the number of time you meet an infected user, but also for a long and, and so on. And uh, regularly uh, the app is connecting to a server and basically ask for its um, status. So basically at this point of time, the server is computing a risk score for this particular user and if the score is larger than a threshold, it will send a one, which means that the user has to call the phone number and blah, blah, blah. If zero, it means that the, the user is fine, is not at risk. So the, 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 the idea is very similar to the GAN, we just have a different architecture. And, and the main motivation for having a centralizing scheme, or centralized scheme, sorry, is that we really wanted the health authority to be able to control the whole system. And, and more actually we wanted the health authority to be able to control the score computation because things are evolving almost every day. We are learning every day 
more and more information about uh, this uh, virus. And, and we think that it's important that this is controlled by the health authority. We also wanted to make sure that the health authority was controlling the notification that was sent out, right? So just imagine there is a bug in the decentralized scheme and suddenly 80% of the people are getting a notification. That would be a panic, right? So it, we thought it was important for the health authority to control the, 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 the system because we have to remember it's a health application, it's not a privacy um, uh, application. So the first objective is really to have a, a spinal that is useful for the health authority. The other uh, motivation was that decentralizing notification is too dangerous because basically what it means is that you have to broadcast the ID of uh, infected node. That this is what happened with the uh, GAN uh, solution. If a node is infected, it broadcasts its key, which are, by the way, private information, personal information. Um, and this data can be used to re identify and trace infected nodes. So there were some attacks, like the corona sniffer attack that show exactly this type of, of risk. And the third point, which is maybe the one that convinced us that it was the right approach, is that the privacy community knows that decentralization has several limitations. The first one is that uh, there is fundamental trade-off between availability, security, and privacy. And I don't think that for this type of application that are very sensitive, you want to trade one of these properties for the others. The other conclusion of this paper is that most decentralized systems end up using server for scalability and abuse control. And I think Carmela's presentation was pretty clear on that, on the difficulty of integrating GAN with the old health system that actually use server, but also with the cloud that using multiple server for abuse control. And the third uh, uh, conclusion was that most of this system makes a realistic assumption about the device security. In this case, basically the whole security of the system uh, uh, rely on the security of the uh, Google and Apple uh, phones. So the paper, the name of the paper is here. It's a paper actually by Carmela. Uh, I'm uh, sorry, you are looking uh, at slide four, but you probably moved on. Okay. Because the, the slide that is displayed on the shared screen is slide number four. Really? You mean is it this one? No. Now it's better. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I was I was showing this one with. You. So the, the the just to illustrate my point. So this is actually the German architecture, the so-called decentralized uh, system. But if you look in more into the details, you see that there is at least there are at least three servers: the portal server, verification server, and and Corona One App server. So that's a lot of server for. A decentralized scheme. So that illustrates pretty well the point that you don't only have to consider one module, you have to consider the whole system. And so far, I didn't see an uh, analysis of a whole system that integrates uh, the Google Apple system within an actual health uh, uh, system. And this is very uh, difficult. And I'm happy that actually Camilla uh, discussed about this point because that's very critical. Uh, so the, the, the old debate about centralized is decentralized. I think that's not really make sense. The main question is, is uh, are, sorry, who do you trust? Do you trust the health authority, considering that there is strong oversight and strong security, and that considering that the data that is being collected are not very critical, they are just to do identifier, or do you trust the users and, and companies like Google and Apple, right? So I let you decide which one you, you actually trust. For us, it was clear that we are trusting more the health authority, because by the way, if you're not trusting the health authority, you have other problems. I mean, you have more serious problems than just cont contact tracing. So you're better off trusting the health authority. The second question that can be discussed is that does privacy mean taking data away from health authorities? Or does it mean to build some trust relationship with them? Okay, and for us, the answer is clear. It's, it's actually to build some trust relationship with, with them. Privacy is not taking data away from, from the uh, institution that needs them. So we're not the only one to, to, to claim to say that. Uh, Shusha Subov, that you probably know, she also uh, said similar things like that, talking about Google, Apple and undercut the legitimate need of public health authority uh, that operates under democracy. Yeah, we should not forget that 
common matter usually adapted. And this is just in a set of intolerable constraints. This is intolerable and incompatible with democracy. There are some more other concerns with GAN. For example, there was this paper from our colleague from Ireland that shows that Google is actually collecting much more data than they're claiming through the Google uh, Play system. Uh, Google and Apple are now moving the whole thing into the, the, the system, so you don't even need to write an application, everything will be in the system. And also the fact that Google is going into the health insurance business should be a concern to, this, uh, to our community. They are not doing it for the sake of humanity. There is clearly a business behind uh, all this. Um, so the, the next step is that we're working on a new scheme, which we call Desire, uh, which I don't know, I will skip for the sake of time. But basically the idea is actually to combine the centralized and decentralized and to use uh, what we call private encounter token instead of um, uh, 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 ephemeral ID. So instead of exchanging ephemeral, ephemeral ID, the nodes are actually generated private encounters using the Fianman uh, protocol. Conclusion, um, there were, this project actually was very fascinated. We've been working like crazy for six months. There are a lot of technical and scientific issues, a lot of politics going on. Um, it shows a lot of weaknesses, especially in Europe. Clearly, Europe is pretty weak in the sense that they were not able to uh, convince, for example, Apple to uh, modify some of the, uh, their system. Uh, it shows the power of companies like Apple and Google and their lobbying strengths. That, that, that was uh, actually very clear. Um, there is a lot of things to be said about the role of researchers and especially privacy researchers in this type of project, uh, and especially uh, the difference between privacy activists and privacy researchers. Uh, a lot of uh, previous, uh, previous uh, for me, it's different, two different things, which was not clear in this project. Some people were just acting like activists and not like researchers. And finally, uh, we, th we should think about the responsibility of our, of our actions. And, and I will just, uh, uh, urge you to read like a nice blog from uh, Paul Francis that discussed about uh, what are the impact of our work and our uh, decisions. Thank you. And yeah, I will just have to finish that talking is easy and doing is difficult. There was a lot of talk during these six last, last months, but doing stuff is actually much more difficult. Unfortunately, today we're doing nothing but talking. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Claude. Uh, appreciate it. And um, now we have uh, Gerald Hubner and Philip Engelmartin from SAP. And uh, as a dynamic duo, together they will have 15 minutes to play with. Okay. Um, can I share now? You should be able to share. Okay. Do you see something? Yes. You're on. Okay, this is uh, Gerald Hübner and Philipp Engelmer from SAP. And uh, we are among the team that uh, developed the German Corona app. So after France, mer uh, merci Claude, you, you jumped the Rhine in the Eastern direction and now we are in Germany and that's where um, Obelix won because we have the decentralized uh, uh, approach in, in Germany. Uh, the German Corona Warn app uh, pr uh, project uh, was a project that was uh, actually uh, uh, kicked off by the Robert Koch Institute, that's the, the federal uh, government disease control agency. And uh, we at SAP, uh, together with the German telecom, the T-Systems, uh, developed the Corona Warnet project. Uh, you, you have just seen uh, this slide already, the overall ar architecture, was, which is relative complicated, relatively complicated. Uh, although we are also sitting on the exposure notification framework interface that uh, Giles uh, introduced at the beginning of, of this workshop, um, uh, there is more complexity added to it because one of, uh, one of the additional uh, purposes of the app is uh, to submit uh, the test result uh, to the user, which, uh, which is more than uh, just uh, proximity tracing. And that's, uh, that's one of the reasons uh, why there is a little more complexity involved here. So um, I, I think I don't have to shed uh, too much words about the exposure notification framework anymore. We've, we've talked about that a lot. Um, interesting in, in Germany was 
that there was a very fierce uh, discussion, a public discussion, and not only within the privacy uh, scenery, uh, but uh, um, in the press between just uh, normal citizens, and they were just very skeptical about the centralized approach. Uh, the German government originally decided to go for the centralized approach, but then uh, because of uh, public pushback, um, redecided and and went down uh, the DP the DP three T path, and and then decided for the design goals go to privacy by design. Was very important the decentralized privacy prever, uh, preserving uh, proximity tracing according to DP three three T. Also a very practical approach because at the same time uh, we heard that um, we learned that Google and um, and, and Apple de decided to build this interface and for practical reasons, of course, it made, made sense to, to use that uh, to get started as fast as possible. Uh, we did the whole project with uh, about 60, 65 the people in home office started in, in May. And um, the design goals besides privacy were to make it very secure, uh, to test it very well and, and vet it in the privacy and security community. So they were all involved, scientific institutes, uh, hacking communities, uh, privacy communities, and so on. Um, and that's why it was very important for the German government. And this was actually uh, closed in the contract. We, we had to do it in open source for transparency reasons so that everybody had a possibility to look at it. And it had to be highly available, even though you see this uh, complexity in the architecture overview, high, highly available because uh, when, a, uh, when a user is tested positively, he has other problems than uh, sharing his uh, keys with the community. So uh, it had to be very easy for people um, to, to do it and uh, instead of having to wait and, and then go back and do it one more time. That's why high, high availability was uh, important. Here is a link that I already shared with uh, the attendees a little earlier, the Corona Warn app. Uh, dot app. Um, that's where you get all the information, including the the privacy assessments and so on. There's lots of information available there. But what what I wanted to do together with uh, Philip is uh, give you a hint about what you, you've seen. You've seen the design goals here: privacy by design and a decentralized privacy preserving proximity tracing approach. But how do you actually do that in a development pro development process? And, and the things that, the, the, the very important thing that really helped us to, to, enable, uh, to enable these, these goals in the project was threat modeling. And uh, it proved to be very helpful to very thoroughly go through a secure development life cycle. Um, that meant that in the first, the first thing we do was threat modeling and made sure that the data protection uh, and uh, privacy re requirements uh, come to the table before even code is committed and then do risk assessment, then plan measures, and then you start developing code and test it and so on. And it was very, very important uh, for us to have the architects and the privacy experts sitting at the table and plan everything very thoroughly be before we, we, we started to develop. And now um, Philip is uh, in the call, and he he will going he's he's going to give a little more insight in how we did that. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Gerald. Um, so in the Corona Warner project, it was pretty unique that um, with the very first day of the project, we kicked off as well uh, the threat modeling activities. Uh, that means that we brought up. Um, all involved colleagues from the architects we brought in uh, data data protection experts security experts developers um, and further project members in into a virtual workshop and discussed the very first architectural draft um, we did together we discussed about um, data data privacy preserving uh, measurements we implemented and we also of course discussed security features because um, for us, it is not only important that we preserve the privacy, but also the data security as we um, implemented as well the test submission and uh, the test result submission to the users of the um, Corona One app. And because of that, we do have this more or less complex architecture 
which is at the very end not that complex. And Geralt, if you like, you can switch over to it quickly. Um, because uh, when you think the, the, the gray box on the right side is the mobile phone with the Corona One app, um, we do have uh, the Corona One Observer, which is just um, taking care of the uh, keys and the verification server is just taking care of the verification um, of the submission of a positive test result. Um, and that's it, more or less. Um, and in that meaning, we also have connections to the test results of the portal server and directly um, the connection into the laboratory information system. And that's that um, we had as well um, a big focus on the security of the application and the overall architecture. Um, when you go back to slide four, Gerard, uh, we can quickly have further uh, insights into the secure software development life cycle at SAP. We do have four phases, usually um, with the preparation phase, the development phase, the transition phase, and the utilization phase. And um, in the Corona One app, of course, the experts were trained already. Um, we do have then the risk assessment part with the threat modeling. We do a product standard assessment where um, the product standard defined in SAP is the knowledge base for all um, other uh, activities around the application development. We do have the data protection compliance evaluation, which is partly done during the threat modeling. And then we hand it over to the planning of security and data protection measures and features uh, to ensure that um, we follow our requirements and the plans. Uh, we also uh, then plan the testing, which is pretty important to ensure that we're um, not falling into pitfalls at the end of the develop, development lifecycle, which would be um, highly costly. And then we proceed with the secure development. So uh, at the end of the Corona One development, we had more um, documentations written than uh, lines of code. This is something which is most probably pretty German, um, but contributed in general to the uh, privacy and data protection of the application. And uh, actually quite successful because we, we had no uh, critical press about privacy. Actually, we didn't hear anything about privacy. It was generally accepted. And the app is also relatively well accepted for, for Germany. More than 18 million uh, downloads, uh, which I would say for the usually very privacy aware Germans is a big success story. So we didn't make any, we, we didn't make too much wrong. Let me put it that way. So with, with that said, we, we give back to Gene. Okay, well, thank you very much. You actually finished um, ahead of your uh, limited uh, time limit, uh, uh, much appreciated. Uh, next is uh, Ahmad Reza Sadegi from TU Darmstadt, who has 12 minutes. Uh, Ahmad, can you please unmute and share your screen? So I am going to share my screen now. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, go ahead, share your screen. Okay, I am doing that now. Just a second. Yes. It's on. You're on. Go ahead. No, wait. I have to go to the presentation. You see that now? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot, Gene, for the invitation. And um, as everybody is uh, seeing, my the title of my talk is a bit long. Uh, and the reason for that is, uh, in contrast to some of my previous uh, speakers, I would like to uh, take you through a journey that... Uh, uh, I had with a number of colleagues and collaborators in China and in US on contact tracing um, because of private, first of all, private interest. And this journey started in December 2019. And we went through a, a, a number of uh, stages. Some stages were enjoyable because we were talking about, uh, uh, you know, security and privacy, if a technology can be uh, deployed in this or that way, and how we can help the society with IT technology. Uh, 
but we had also a number of uh, uh, frustrating and uh, uh, and disappointing moments and i want to re uh, 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 report that as a lecture so the lessons learned and what are these bad moments where with politicians incompetencies uh, lobbyists and corporate greed that is uh, very critical in this context and i hope i can um, um, convince you to have critical mind and uh, i can of course go through the technical aspects but i keep it low because there are more important aspects to talk uh, about that and claude already uh, touched on uh, some of them so uh, how did my story start? I came back in, from China in 2000, and December 2019, and I didn't feel good. At the end, I didn't have any, any sickness, but um, I got myself uh, into going to a doctor, and uh, they didn't even let me into their practice, and it is still like this, yeah, interestingly. Um, and then I had contact with my colleagues in, in Wuhan, because I'm very often in, in China, and I, I got a lot of uh, news from the, what's happening in China. So already in January, February, we started to think about how can technology help? How can we be uh, of, of help? And how could we start to use uh, uh, IT technology in, in a certain way to help uh, 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 breaking the infection chains? We heard from uh, the approaches in China. And so uh, there were all these discussions about the centralized systems started in Asia because when we call them a centralized, okay, a central party has uh, control over data and these uh, uh, and in china they, they collected every data through alipay and through all other companies who were uh, working on, on that in in uh, uh, singapore is different thing and in, in uh, um, australia or other uh, countries and also in europe centralized systems popped up and we were of course uh, in, in germany and germany has, has uh, very strict uh, privacy laws as everybody knows and also uh, we have European GDRP. So we, we started to think about decentralized uh, uh, systems that are now popping up everywhere already in February. The reason was we wanted to see, uh, to answer two questions. Can we help? Second, is it possible? And what are actually the challenges there? Not from the scientific point of view, because many things were clear before, but from practical engineering point of view. So we teamed up with uh, UC San Diego, but also with uh, Zhejiang University in, in Hangzhou uh, to understand what are actually the, the problems that we have beyond the uh, uh, tracing app. So our work is called Trace Corona. You can read it on, on uh, uh, comprehensively on our web page, but I don't, I'm not going to go through that. I just touch on some of the principles. However, we saw that uh, making this app and bring it uh, uh, and, and discussing it with, with the community has turned out to be not only a, 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 an engineering and scientific aspect, but a kind of a matter of uh, national pride. So there's a competition between countries and Europe is very weak in that uh, sense, as Claude said. And also there is a competition between academia, academia lobby for certain uh, uh, enterprises. And that is really disappointing. So now this happened. All of a sudden, Google and Apple found the love that they missed and they started the world domination wedding. They had their own API and we heard enough about it, which, is, which we call gap, because it is a gap when it comes to many aspects that I'm going to talk about. So they provide that. And if you have a pandemic election ballot, you have a number of uh, uh, countries that are using their own system and you have a number of companies that took the comfortable way amongst them the German, German uh, uh, Republic um, to take, to use API by Google and Apple because this is the, 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 the easiest way you can do. And uh, there are also, I had the discussion with many colleagues all over the world. I had the discussions with MIT people, I had discussions with any other uh, 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 app provider. And it's very interesting to see how politics play here a big role. So we wanted to have an independent uh, solution. And, and some of the uh, um, design principles that we were actually looking at, we are not, uh, we are not looking to promoting a system for being deployed because that puts a lot of pressure on a university to be responsible for such a thing. We were talking about the challenges. 
like scalable privacy, like independence from OS vendors, like efficient interoperability. Uh, Kamala talked about that a bit. Like better reliability, for example, if you have uh, contact uh, with, with an infected person, how can you prove that after the fact? Better security and privacy than GAP. Uh, this is the Google and Apple approach. And also combining contact tracing with physiological data. That is very important because they deliver also some other information about uh, the health uh, uh, status of a person. So I just put here a, a, a table where you can see uh, some of the uh, more known, so to say, centralized uh, um, uh, um, approaches like Blue Trace in Singapore or PEP uh, PT that is still in some of the countries uh, is, is, is being used. This was uh, what Gerald was talking about, debated in, in, in Germany heavily because some activists were, were, were against it and there were also a lobby, uh, a big lobby for that. And the same lobby started to lobby gap at the end. And that's very interesting uh, to observe. So these are some criteria. You can uh, uh, be co collected all the information from the all uh, schemes you could uh, get and you combine them together uh, and compare them. Uh, you can see that on our webpage, but also in this paper a bit. Um, however, we, we were interested in what are, for example, uh, attack surfaces, like uh, movement profiling of, of users, movement profiling of infected users, because this was always about uh, uh, privacy. And also relay attack. This is something which is uh, about security. There are also many other attack services, as Claude was talking about, in the system itself. But this is just a simplified, so to say, a table. And as you see, some of the uh, uh, schemes, like the, the centralized one, cannot, they are vulnerable to these attacks. So, for example, that you can movement profile the infected users, and some of the decentralized ones are not uh, vulnerable, depending on, on their implementation. And they can give certain guarantees, for example, to relay attacks, and they uh, may not be able to give those guarantees to relay attacks, as it is the case for many of them. So, let me uh, <coughs> talk about uh, the relay attack and tracing attack that is also sometimes is considered as these are all known attacks. This is not something new. Everybody knew that, that the system is vulnerable to these attacks. There are a lot of uh, uh, essays about that. And uh, this is what uh, we started to think of, okay, besides developing our own uh, stuff, um, that we think it, is, it has uh, several advantages, but this is not my problem because I think all of them are not of much use. Um, can we do run an attack, a real world attack on Google and Apple uh, tracing uh, uh, interface? The answer is yes. So you can read it in this paper, but which is called Mind the Gap. Uh, the wormhole attack, which is a relay attack, what we did, uh, as an example, we have other examples, but I do not disclose them today. Between Marburg, Frankfurt, and Darmstadt, you can set a wormhole that uh, it's very simply you can just uh, uh, use the RPIs. We did it with the German Corona Barn app, and we can generate a lot of uh, fake encounters. And that, we, why we do that? Because we want to be faster than our Russian friends or Chinese friends that maybe one day do that for us. Uh, it's not a joke. You can think about it. This system is a, like a critical infrastructure, and you can, it is our health system and you let uh, Google and Apple come in, and this could have consequences like any other, like social media, it can be a vehicle. So this is kind of that you can show it even with uh, current app. And also tra uh, uh, tracing attack is simple. Uh, you put a, a number of, of sensors around the city and you can do it, we can also do it for a bigger city. We also had planned to go to the places where there is hotspots and then you can, uh, really uh, connect the dots together by using, for example, these small, nice, tiny devices that we spread uh, in on strategically uh, selected places like police station, uh, clinics, uh, uh, um, train stations, and then collect data. And you can see that infected people can be uh, followed. So you, you can uh, uh, extract because people have, have routines. They come to job, they go back, they go to the house, they go, they go to shopping, and you can see them. And think about it, that Google and Apple, which included that in their operating system, uh, they have access to much, much more data. Okay, so uh, this is something that I was discussing with Ross Anderson, my colleague, 
uh, about uh, uh, tracing apps and I presented what we have and he said to me, look, this is all uh, disaster capitalism. So I borrowed this from him. Uh, the properties of tracing app based on gap are, I mean, there are a lot of good properties. This shows that government industrial complex is very much, in, very much in, 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 in running uh, during the pandemic. It has, at least in Germany, a huge amount of costs. It suppresses in innovation because you do not have diversity. There is a huge lobby running here. Uh, it threatens sovereignty, and I will come to that. And security and privacy is so la la. And effectiveness, I will come to that as well. Let me cite the French government's declaration on tracing apps. Uh, I just read it for you. Health of the, the health of the French people is a task that falls exclusively to the state and not to private international actors. It's a question of health and technological sovereignty. This includes also our app. I'm not criticizing other apps, although I think our app is much better. This is my bragging part, but doesn't matter. All of them, they must be put under a, a big, big, big uh, kind of microscope and you, we have to look at them in a public debate. Okay, so uh, what, how effective is actually German's Corona War app? And I must also here say, as uh, uh, Jean said, I have to give her this provocative talk and I'm not scratching on Gerald's uh, eyes. I know him for many, many years. He is doing his job. They are doing perfect. That is good. They have a very good contract with German government. And I, I, I like that uh, SAP as a representative company is successful by getting a lot of money for it, developing it. That is absolutely okay. But how effective are all these apps in general? So estimated 6,440 from the German CDC have shared their diagnosis keys through the CWA, as German Corona uh, Warner, by September 29. And this corresponds to 6.5% of the persons tested positive on COVID-19 since the start of the year. And what is actually the information of how many tests were triggered by CWA? Do we know that? Is there any study on that? At least the public uh, is not in, in informed. And the public was never informed because when the, uh, uh, when the German chancellor goes to the microphone and says, take this app, many people in Germany trust government. So the number of download is not uh, 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 an indication of success. The usage and the studies that comes afterwards is a, is a measure for success. And is there any uh, information on how many of these people who were warned were actually uh, uh, positively tested? So with that, I think uh, I'm coming to the conclusion. My conclusion is the following. These Corona app development are very good. We can make papers, we can do all these things, and we can co uh, compete with each other. However, the, the effectiveness compared to the costs are very low. This is my personal view. This is not the personal, <laughs> this is not the view of Technical University Darmstadt or any other company we've worked with. There must be freedom for innovation and evaluation of these digital technologies. We need diversity and take the best one. We need also more technology to help people and let them through a uh, platform. Camilo showed in a very short uh, uh, slide, that is much more important to have a health advisor that can anonymously talk to people who are uh, insecure if they are uh, uh, sick or not. More studies on effectivity of these technologies should be done and I think uh, we started uh, to think, okay, if we want to do a technological aspect, why do we uh, really stick to mobile phones? Why not combining physiological data with tracing, uh, like for example, with smart maps? And we have developed that as well. I can go through the, uh, the technical things as well. If you're interested, you can contact me. But this is a technological part, but I'm uh, not getting really, uh, I'm not really interested much more in the technological part and all the privacy nice things that we did, I am more now interested in, in the effectivity of these uh, things. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ahmad. Uh, this is our penultimate talk. The last talk of the session is by Soteris Dimetriou from Imperial College, and that should be uh, like, what, about seven minutes? Uh, so Soteris, you have the floor. Please unmute and share your screen.
I uh, cannot uh, start screen share while someone else is sharing. Oh, uh, can you please? Uh, oh, no, uh, okay. okay, sorry. Can you, can you can you share now? Yeah. Oh, that should be great. coming oh, up. Great. All good. All right. So I believe you can uh, all see my slides now. All right. So hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Athena. Uh, thanks, June, and the proper data team for the invitation and for organizing this. Um, I think my talk is going to put more uh, more oil on the fire. Uh, even though we uh, haven't built uh, an app ourselves, uh, I am going to be talking about um, uh, what I think to be an important attack surface on, on smartphones, uh, which uh, kind of challenges uh, the um, uh, the choice of using mobile apps as the uh, appropriate technology uh, for uh, digitally assisting uh, contact tracing. Uh, so uh, the attacks I'm going to be talking about are made possible uh, partly due to the complexity of mobile operating systems. And in particular, these systems have a functionality which is designed to support programs or applications from several uh, that are not necessarily um, uh, trusted sources. Uh, in fact, there are around 3 million apps available on Android devices uh, if you go to the official Android application store. And we expect users on average to install 95 such apps uh, on their phones. And this creates an issue of multi-tenancy on the smartphone platform. And the Android operating system, as um, any other uh, operating system, does offer traditional process isolation guarantees. Um, however, incidental information on the system, which is available to third-party mobile apps, can be used as side channel uh, by an adversarial app to perform inferior attacks on uh, either other coinstall apps or on device and uh, user information directly. Uh, here I will show the high level process of inferring an Android user's identity and an Android user's uh, location. Uh, and this comes from work we've conducted in the past uh, with uh, Xiaoyong, uh, Zhu Xiaofeng, Wang, Mohamed Nabit, and other colleagues. And in this scenario, the adversary is any app on the phone. Um, and their goal is to launch the attack without requesting any permission at all. And the adversarial mobile app, to succeed in our case, must detect whenever the user creates an online trace through their phone. And in our example, the adversary will be focusing on detecting when the victim posts uh, a tweet. Um, however, this um, observation of uh, posting a tweet is supposed to be deterred by the OS uh, process isolation mechanisms, right? Uh, so why is this possible? Uh, well, Android is built on top of a stripped down version of a complex Linux kernel where security policies are not always uh, correctly, correctly uh, configured. Uh, indeed, we found uh, back then that some of the files made available to third-party apps uh, used to reveal the amount of information sent and received over the network by a, a target process uh, on the operating system. And we showed that by continuously monitoring such uh, information when the target app, when the victim app is running, the adversarial app can fingerprint and thus identify the event uh, of posting a tweet. Now for the attack to complete and succeed, the adversary also needs to know from where the tweets have been posted. And we demonstrated that this is possible uh, to be done by any app without even requesting the location permission or having location privileges on the Android operating system. And as such can be stealthy to both the user and the operating system. And the culprit here is another unprotected file which uh, reveals the MAC address of the last access point the phone has connected to. And again, by continuously monitoring uh, such information, the adversarial app can create these surrogate uh, tables with uh, MAC addresses, essentially tracking the MAC addresses. And, um, and next, the, your question should be, how can we get location given MAC addresses? Well, for this community, uh, the answer should be, it's not that hard, uh, but there is a very easy way they're actually um, uh, navigation services out there that create very detailed associations between GPS coordinates and um, uh, public access point MAC addresses. And such information is um, often made available online for free or for a very uh, small and affordable fee, uh, thus making identification of a device's uh, location possible. 
So now in our example, I uh, hope I convinced you that the adversary any mobile app can get the timestamps of each of the uh, user's tweets and the location of the device. Uh, now they can just simply invoke the public Twitter API, uh, which is gonna respond with a set of uh, Twitter users that have uh, posted that tweet, uh, a tweet, at those particular times around that particular location. So if we repeat the process for every detected uh, tweet, then we can uniquely uh, also identify the user of the device, essentially compromising both uh, location and, and identity uh, here. Um, there are obviously other uh, primitive events that can be potentially detected with side channels. Uh, for example, we know that when the uh, when contact tracing is on, especially when using the um, um, the, the Google Apple um, uh, notification exposure notification API, this creates a very distinctive uh, power consumption profile. Um, and um, moreover. Uh, whenever we receive a push notification, which has been the way a lot, a lot of the apps uh, propose um, of notifying users about potential exposure, uh, this is also uh, very easy to detect uh, by any mobile app just by using uh, accelerometer data or checking whether the speaker is on or off um, because uh, receiving notification will induce uh, either vibration um, um, or, or a sound. And, and this uh, data can be accessed again without um, uh, having any privileges uh, on the device. Um, uh, lastly, um, there, there were also some discussions uh, about um, instead of linking uh, tests, um, uh, COVID positive tests with validation codes inside the apps to allow users to self-report symptoms and then make the, the inference somewhere else. Um, uh, we do also want to um, bring uh, uh, to people's attention that whenever you send those reports uh, through the network, there also might be uh, a noticeable uh, network event uh, uh, being created. Um, uh, other practical uh, consideration ha has to do uh, with um, um, how different stakeholders uh, decide uh, to implement those apps. So we have seen the case with the Indian app, for example, um, which collects location and identifying information directly um, and shares that with the, uh, uh, with the server. Um, some other approach, approaches, um, they, they said we don't need access to location, so let's access VLE information uh, instead. Uh, however, the problem uh, with that approach is that the majority of Android devices uh, that have version 10 and before, uh, to get access to VLE information that uh, you need to um, also have access, um, and that also provides you access uh, to location information, and that has to do with implementation inside the, uh, the operating system. Um, last but not least, uh, technology can always be misused by humans. Uh, probably uh, you have seen uh, this attack uh, to inject fake events on Google Maps to create fake traffic. So I am also dreadful of an infection injection scenario where somebody uh, fakes an infection and purposefully start uh, digitally infecting uh, other devices. Uh, so with this, I'll conclude my horror story here, um, and I look forward to your uh, questions and comments. Okay, thank you very much, Soteris. Uh, so now we have something like 22 minutes, which we may turn into like 25 minutes if there is a, a demand and interest. Uh, and now I will share my screen and... Um, pose a couple of, uh, a few questions. Uh, there are eight questions on this slide. Um, I would like the um, panelists to turn on their cameras if, I, if they want. Um, they don't have to, uh, but, um, and I, I would like them to, I, I've emailed them these questions uh, about an hour ago. Uh, Apologies to those who may have not read email, but um, and, and I, I apologize also in advance for, for maybe the tone of some of these questions. They, um, they are not being asked by someone who, is, uh, who has built uh, contact tracing or uh, exposure notification apps, that is myself. <laughs> so I'm very much a kind of a, um, an educated bystander. But I think some of the, at least some of these questions are pretty intuitive and pretty natural. 
And I also suspect, I know, I know that some of them have been already answered by, by some of your talks. But if you have something to contribute or something to answer, you can answer them in any order. So uh, let's go ahead. I'm gonna take number two. I don't know how you wanna do this, so I'm just jumping. Go ahead. So to me, this was not the choice. This was a given. When I arrived working on this thing, there was not an option of are we gonna use something or not. There was an option of that was gonna nap is was gonna be deployed and was we deployed at the European <laughs> level. And then my only worry was that there was not a new surveillance infrastructure created. Now, as very well would Ahmad and Claude um, remarked, indeed, the fact that we have an, a smartphone means that we're calling for big tech to come and play the game. That again was not the choice. It was the choice of governments that decided that smartphones were the way to go. Why was that? Uh, if somebody here can speak for a government, I will be happier. And indeed, the result of this was a shift of power of health data to Google and Apple that also doesn't make happy, <laughs> doesn't make me happy at all. And, and indeed, I, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of discussion here on this. And it is very important. And again, the hand is on the governments on saying, no, we don't want more data there. We ask them to produce a Bluetooth library and suddenly we have many more things, right? And this is uh, governments, the ones that have to recover the sovereignty. But I don't particularly think that this is a question of a protocol having put in place that actually makes sure that there's no surveillance infrastructure and the social graph is not on a central server. But it's a very different thing that uh, we can and may discuss. Thank you. Anybody uh, else, uh, feel free to jump in and answer, uh, follow up or just answer, jump around the questions. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, if nobody else wants, uh, I, I, um, I don't want to comment. Uh, I mean, what, what Camilla said, I agree uh, completely. Um, it is not, uh, um, when, when researchers look in, 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 into the privacy um, and security aspects, as we did also with, with our development. So, our development, uh, we were finished in, uh, in May, and the German government uh, at the end found uh, um, two companies, two representative companies, and I think that is good. That is a good thing that SAP and the Telecom were involved. I don't find, uh, I don't think that it, it, the cost is, is uh, um, justifiable for, for, for me as, as a citizen. And I think that there was, uh, again, a, a big uh, lobby aspect. Uh, just to come to Kamala's uh, um, uh, um, protocol aspect. We didn't have a chance to discuss this with, uh, at least in Germany, I don't uh, care about uh, Switzerland, uh, because they do what they want to do, they always do what they want to do, but we didn't have a chance to discuss that. There was public debate at the beginning uh, due to the uh, centralistic as aspect, which is also going in the wrong direction. However, as I said, the same lobbyists changed all of a sudden to another uh, system decentralized. So the, there were other protocols there, also in all over Europe. And I was talking to a number of people, especially in Spain, that they didn't use any app. They use only a questionnaire over web interface. And they get within one and a half hours, it's also documented on our web page, uh, more than 150,000 answers from people who were terrified and saying, I can't go to quarantine because I live with five other people in, in a house. What can I do? So these are even more important than, than investing millions in an in a, in a app where we don't know all, uh, all these pieces that you put together, uh, uh, Camilla. These pieces are, are even more important. And, and my eyes also went open, OK? Uh, this is why I, I personally was I was kind of shocked that we were looking into the design rather into the reality. Feel free to jump in. Anybody have? So I can I can take number five and uh, also a comment on, on Ahmed's comment, if you if you don't mind. Please. So what do you think about uh, your app's acceptability by often reluctant and suspicious populists? So these uh, these populists usually are not accessible to arguments. 
So my my experience is, if if somebody uh, has that kind of a mindset, it's probably not not possible to convince him by arguments. It's it's more more or less uh, feelings. So it's soft factors. It's not not facts that you need to put on the table. However, um, what what we experienced is to make the app more transparent and put open source on the table, invite everybody to discuss and uh, and have uh, access to the code on, on GitHub and, and just have have this community completely involved. Did help in a lot of cases, however, not all of them. Um, after all, there is a, a certain amount of complexity involved. Sometimes it's a little bit hidden. So this is partly an answer um, to Ahmed's comment. So when you when you look at the cost of the app. It's not only the app you see on the smartphone, phone, it's the whole system. And when you look at Germany, and this is probably true for some other countries as well, um, so digitalization is not at a level where we do want it to be. For example, from about 200 um, laboratories that uh, do COVID-19 tests, uh, at the beginning of the app when we launched it, there were only like 15 or uh, 20, even online. And uh, so how do you automize, how do you, how do you automate the whole process then when the, the test result doesn't come back uh, digitally um, because uh, the, the lab uh, is, is not uh, connected to the lab server, right? That, that can only be, uh, that can only be handled by a call center that gives people a ton uh, that they get them to um, to attest that they have a positive test result and, and can upload their keys. The vast majority of the money paid for the whole system, not only the app, went to the call center, not to the app. So you should really look where the money goes. And it's it's not always, uh, it's not always uh, that easy. That's yeah. something to discuss. Uh, it puzzles me as well. Today, we only have about 15 or 20 labs that are not uh, uh, connected. But, um, well, uh, the, the, whole, the whole system is, is not working as, as smoothly as you, you would expect it to work. Uh, that's, that's something where, where we need to think about the impact of, of privacy as well. So for example, um, can, you, can you really do uh, a, a consent on a piece of uh, paper where doctors and, and uh, test facilities don't, uh, don't like to do it? They are just reluctant to make their cross in, hey, uh, the, uh, the user has consented and then you get the, the, the result back. Um, the, the process is difficult and not not all actors are as constructive always as we'd like them to be. I, I personally think this is not only true for Germany. This is pro probably a world worldwide issue. But you look at but you really have to look at all these facts and all together, it, it uh, com comprises uh, to to cost and, and difficulties. It's it's not just the money for the app. It's not just not true. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Gerald. Um, anyone else? Again, you have, the freedom. you have the freedom. I just want to say, uh, hold on, Ahmad. Uh, uh, anybody? Gina, I would like to make a comment, but whenever you're ready. Who is this? Lalita? This is Lalita. Yes, please. Go ahead. So, uh, I mean, the people here are doing amazing stuff at a broader scale. And I'm going to talk about it in a narrow scale at ASU. And I want to talk about three things. Um, uh, ASU is running one of the largest uh, saliva tests for COVID-19. And it's been, it has a very high true positive rate. Um, it, we're also mandating collecting these consent, uh, these surveys. You have to do the app by afternoon, otherwise you get level one, um, you know, an email with a threat and then it keeps going on from there. Uh, and the app is obviously mandatory, right? In spite of all that, if I had, if we had to get the survey data, we have to get a consent. So that is really a problem if you had to build any kind of a predictive model based on that. Uh, in terms of even, in spite of all this app, there's still, it, it seems even at this level, it's very hard for them to do digital contact tracing and build into it. These students are taking tests. The tests are not being somehow mixed in with the app data. It's just not happening. So even at our simple level, 
there are so many challenges. We're trying to convince the testing people to collaborate with the UTO people, even though they're talking to one another, to make sure that the students who are infected, right now, the students who are infected, there's physical contact tracing going dorm to dorm to alert the neighbors and so on without revealing their, you know, their, their private, their pers uh, the identification of the person. But uh, getting them to do this in a seamless manner through the app seems so hard that I'm open to getting feedback myself from some of the people. I see it at this level, at just a university level, but still it's already a hard problem connecting um, testing data to getting consent, to using the survey, to actually getting contact tracing going. So I'm open to any thoughts from others on this as I see it on the ground. Thank you, Alifa. Uh, I just want to echo Lalitha's comment. So we've done some studies in the past also that involves collective depression and insomnia data, and, and it is, it's very hard to make that happen. So, so I'm, I'm very surprised that it was so easy uh, to allow whatever technologist uh, to have access uh, to that information. And my point that I were making is that by having access to that information, you are creating um, uh, opportunities uh, for also uh, at least other hundred entities that share that platform to learn that information uh, potentially. So Teres, you, you make a very good point. In fact, we cannot directly use the survey data from the app platform. We have to go through a consent system offline on, an, on, on a, on a web-based platform, only through the consent and the data will go to a HIPAA container and we can only operate on that through that. And nobody else can get that data. And it's the same with this startup I'm working with. I cannot get that data. And they, they have a tutorial data that we're building a model on and they will test the model ultimately. So all of what you say, HIPAA is a big deal here and I totally hear you on this. I, I agree with you. Thank you. Uh, Claude. Uh... Yeah, yeah, uh, maybe I can take six and, and, and eight. So about the fancy exotic crypto, no, we didn't use any uh, exotic crypto. Actually, it's not a research project. It was really difficult because it's an engineering project. There is a lot of integration to be done. So it's really more about engineering than, than I would say research at this stage. And, and that's maybe why it's something that we will learn and maybe why that seems like- It could be in my opinion. Yeah, but uh, no, because of the time, we had to do something very quickly and we didn't have time to that's why maybe I want to couple the question eight with six. Why not to work with for the future pandemic? I think we we'll learn a lot from these last six months, and next time we'll do things uh, uh, differently. So a lot of things that we we'll learn, as I said, is that decentralization is a nice concept, but does not work in practice because you have to integrate it with a real system that are already deployed. So if you have to integrate a decent, decentralized system into a system that is centralized, like the health uh, system, you end up having a centralized system, right? Uh, so this is more like engineering than, 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 uh, than, than, um, than, than research. And, and I'm sure that what we're learning and what we learn will be very useful for the future pandemic. I mean, I, I hope we won't have a future pandemic, but uh, it, I think- it, it We will. will. Yeah. We will. May I say something, uh, yeah. Gene? Uh, unless, sorry, I, I just want to, I'm not, I, you know, I definitely have you on, on, on the queue, but okay. if somebody who hasn't spoken yet wants to say something, no? Going once, going twice? Okay, I'm on you. <laughs> so so I, I, I would like to just, uh, I don't know if it is already answered, but uh, uh, I, I would like to um, uh, point to the uh, question one and question two. Um, uh, and maybe question three a bit, or maybe also question four. No, 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 I said just go for, 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 for question, one, question one and two. Okay. Um, so is the design potential security expert? This is, is of course very generic question, and this is a very good question because if you have an exploit, uh, in, in, uh, you, you can use a, a number of beautiful things. You put an exploit on, 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 on Apple uh, or, or Google, uh, store you you incentivize it that people download it and you can can have a kind of bluetooth sniffer uh, use it on your device you can do a lot of amazing things but um, indeed it is and i'm sure these attacks will come for all the gap users uh, be aware we are not going to 
uh, sleep. But you must also consider the following uh, uh, danger of this. If we are going to continue uh, uh, in Germany attack uh, any, any gap-based system with our collaborators, and I'm sure there are lots of hackers, they are waiting to see is the system effective and they are going to run uh, large scale attacks as they did it in the US with uh, trolls in, in, in social media. That will happen, I, I guarantee you. Uh, if, you give, uh, uh, if you give the devil so much power, if it comes not through the uh, door, it comes through the window. And this is why we, we let two big data collectors in, in our uh, health system. Now, uh, these exploits, they need a lot of other aspects to take care of them. For example, to vet the whole uh, uh, databases of, of, of stores to see if there are such a exploits inside. How, how about exploits that users who don't know how to use the app, there will be uh, specialized exploits for that. And people are already working on that, I know that. So, uh, but there is one point that you have to see. The problem is when we attack these systems, we are also attacking indirectly our own public health system. And, uh, and, and then there is a consciousness about that, that we don't want to do that. I don't want to be responsible that my students attack a system that the bloody government put in, in place that I, as a citizen, I'm not agree with it because I don't want Google. Google and Apple are already in my sleeping room. Why should they also come to my health records? So I don't want that. And, and, and this is a very serious thing. And students must be very critical about that. And also, I don't want to attack our public uh, health system. That is one, one big problem that I hesitate to run real tough attacks. I'm doing, I'm going to do that because I'm not agreeing with this comfortable approach. And the second question, yes, as I said in my talk, we have already put all these things on a, on a device that is kind of a smart uh, device because think about the schools, the small kids, they don't have a smartphone. Think about, think about many corporations. They currently, they are talking about their own devices and their own system. They don't want the Google Apple uh, uh, thingy. They, they want the, to manage their own quarantine time they, uh, on their own. So this is what is going to happen. And uh, this is what we, we foresaw, foresaw uh, many months ago. And this is why we implemented that also for uh, uh, smart devices. However, you need a smart device provider who comes or manufacturer comes and I put this on my gadget. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Ahmad. Um, anybody else uh, that wants to take any of the questions? I can take number three as well. And I'm going to, I mean, I don't know if I'm going to actually answer exactly what you were thinking, but I'm going to link it to something that Ahmad said before, which is very, very important, which is like the, the survey in Spain, right, where they say a lot of people cannot afford quarantines. And that's something I would expect, for instance, in the United States, where the economy is much weaker for many people, and, and probably are the people that will have more notifications, because we know that this thing, yeah. And that is actually, I think, not something that we should try to solve completely as scientists, right? This is not really because we put it on the health system. This is a social technical system that comes with other things. And there is a lot of social support that should be given again by governments, right? There has to be laws that have this thing. In Switzerland, we got, for instance, to put that um, being quarantined because of the app. It's not that the app sends you to quarantine, then you call and then uh, you call the hotline and you end up with a, a cantonal doctor giving you a quarantine. That counts as a sick leave. Yep. So these are little things, but um, it is very important that we can do more of these things because otherwise it will going to happen. And I think that that was for universities or what happened uh, at the University of Illinois, where they had all of this plan. They were testing students like crazy, but then they didn't take into account that the students would not isolate and they would go to the party after the positive. We don't allow people to follow the rest of the protocols. And that is not about technology. So the what about collateral damage? I think that this is much more probably of something again that we have to turn back to governments and say, maybe yeah, a lot of the millions Ahmad that they're spent in this technology should be spent on giving help to people to be able to quarantine and we would be better. I don't know. And some countries can afford it, right? Switzerland is certainly a place one country that certainly can afford it, but many cannot.
Anybody else? There's also another question from the audience that I'd like to pose. Uh, are you worried about relay surveillance attacks, relay and or surveillance attacks coming from other apps and not hardware? This is an additional question. I can comment on that one. I think it's- uh, We have a few minutes. I think it's certainly uh, possible. And uh, most of the things that we were looking at is uh, how other coin stalled apps uh, can learn information and break the isolation boundaries on an operating system. And uh, I think this is uh, something that can definitely um, uh, happen. Uh, I also understand uh, Ahmed's uh, point that, yeah, you can also have a uh, hardware uh, that you distribute at uh, hotspots. Uh, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's more scalable uh, and, and economical uh, to distribute a third party application on Google Play Store that offers a very fancy functionality and then get that easily installed on people's devices and then uh, do all these attacks. I agree, I agree. I think we lost uh, Gene, maybe his connection dropped out. Uh, so uh, maybe I can make another point until uh, they close our session. I was wondering if we were to start this all over again, and given the knowledge that we're gonna put all this money and effort into this, uh, whether we're gonna be taking a different approach. And um, I, I can't say much about that, but uh, I see people on the panel that they have been involved with uh, uh, some of the efforts uh, that, uh, so what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, thoughts on that? Uh, go ahead, Claude. No, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. No, no. I go up. No, I mean, I, I was mentioning in my talk that we're working on, on another scheme, which we call Desire, which is kind of a hybrid scheme that mix centralized and decentralized. Um, and and um, so if we had to do it all over again, I think we will actually most likely go for this approach. So instead of, instead of broadcasting ephemeral IDs, we will have these private encounters, which provide more uh, confidentiality. And we still think that we keep this uh, server for the, for the risk computation, because we still think that it's super important that the health authority keep control out of the system and, and all the notification is sent. But maybe the, the ID identification, uh, ID generation could be uh, uh, decentralized. So, yeah. My answer is if I had to do it all again, like now the question to user Teres is, do we have the time like to design desire and do all the things so that it works? Or are we back in time to have the same short amount of time and extremely huge number of constraints? I think it would design the same protocol. I would, def I would defend the same protocol and maybe could have had a different strategy with respect to Google and others. And different things in that respect. But I would not change the protocol at all. Athena, I'm going to have to drop out. Um, I don't see Jean. I so, really enjoyed being a part of this. Thank you. So it doesn't mean that the panel is, uh, has ended uh, now or we can just uh, drink some wine? Um, yeah, you're king of the panel. It's oh, lunch time like... over here, so I don't know what's the technical problem with Jean. I think this is a good time to, to stop. It was the time uh, planned for lunch break anyway. So thank you everyone for a good discussion. Um, and thanks uh, for those of you in Europe that uh, make the time at night to join us. So we'll take a half an hour break thanks. for those of us here to take a lunch break and be back in half an hour. Um, Jean, if you are there, you want to say any closing uh, Words. I think he has some technical problems. I hope he is not attacked by Google and Apple. I think he's finding the wine. I had. <laughs> I was not attacked by Google, Apple, uh, or COVID. <laughs> I was just momentarily locked out of my office because some maintenance <laughs> people decided to show up. Anyway, but I'm back. <laughs> I, this is uh, probably the good time to end the session and thank. Uh, 
all the panelists for their participation and for, for those of you outside the US, uh, in Europe, for staying up uh, this late and uh, you know spending your Friday night doing this. Much appreciated. Thank you, Andrew, you're welcome. Two more things, two more things. If people can take some time to answer the remaining questions uh, before we go. And also one more thing, um, the experience we have is suboptimal for uh, attendees. Uh, because they don't have much uh, many ways to interact with us. So per popular demand for whoever brave stays until the end, the last half an hour will take live questions from the attendees. All right? Okay, please stay.